Welcome to the Nia Judge Juan podcast. My name is Isaac. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess and I discuss internal martial arts, qigong, and meditation. Uh, this week we continue our discussion of Leo Hung Jae's life. We discuss his approach to martial arts. We take a look at Alex Cosma's 1999 book, Esoteric Warriors. There's a section in there by Bruce uh, that discusses Leo. Uh, then we get into the third swing portion of the Energy Gates book. We talk about using the quad to power the swing, how to protect your knees, benefits to your internal organs. Uh, also, check out our Patreon for uh, interviews and videos and lessons and all that good stuff. Hope you enjoy the episode and thanks for listening and thanks for your support. Take care. Welcome back to the Nei Jia Chuan Podcast with Isaac and Jess. We're continuing our journey exploring the Opening the Energy Gates of Your Body book by B.K. Francis. We've reached a point in the discussion where we're digging deeper into the life of the teacher Leo Hong Jae, who's profiled in the book, a really remarkable and uh, fascinating and inspiring teacher. And so we've, we've spent some time digging through some other sources, magazines and books from the past that include little bits and pieces about Leo's life that we thought would be interesting. We're going to take a look now at Esoteric Warriors by Alex Cosma from 1998. Here, uh, there's a profile of B.K. Francis that includes a section on Leo Hong Jae. Leo had everything, but most remarkable of all was his mind-boggling level of simplicity. I was already pretty strong the first day I met him in Beijing. He was sitting in a chair, I remember, and looked as though he weighed 110 pounds at best. I put every ounce of my strength against him, but I could not even move his finger. But whenever he moved his own finger, it would move me. No games, no tricks. No matter what I did, he did not care. Leo told me then, there is more to energy than being young and strong. There is also your chi and your mind. Leo was stronger than the others I studied with, but he was not faster. As a matter of fact, his speed was not even very impressive. What I learned about Leo was that he no longer needed speed because he had absolutely transcended it. Most people who can move very fast do so by disconnecting and creating large gaps in their movement and awareness. In the internal martial arts, Reaching a level at which everything is one piece and connected is like finding the Holy Grail. Leo had attained this level of skill, and it made speed games seem like child's play in comparison. Um, That's a pretty cool little breakdown about Leo. And I think there's something about, you know, here's an old man who doesn't have that much raw physical speed, but somehow his arm is always in the right place at the right time, and you kind of walk into it. Um, And I've had that experience before where, especially internal martial arts like Xing Yi or Bagua, you know, if you move your body a certain way, you don't have to whip your hand really fast. It's like your hand stays connected to your body and through the body movement, the hand ends up sort of being in their stomach or in their face when they advance towards you. What do you think? Yeah, that's, that's sort of the first level of it is t- it's timing, right? That you position yourself so that the other person's, movement kind of lands in a way that's at an advantage to you um i think this is a level up from that where if you can feel what the other person is doing you don't really have to move that fast you can time it where you know they can be moving really fast and you just have to make one little adjustment and they go flying off in the other direction. So I think the other part of it is close to 70 years of martial art training. Right. You don't get to that level just by sitting on your booty. You know, yeah. the, the, this dude had a lot of, as they would say, a lot of gung fu. And the, the internal power part of it, uh, you know, Bruce talks about speed in, in three different mm-hmm. ways. There's... um speed from point a to point b um speed from uh touch right where you you touch the person and you move from there right so that the amount of time it takes after you make contact Mm. and then uh the speed of the mind essentially in that if i can feel what your body is doing on a unconscious level your movement slows down and I can just kind of fill into the gaps. So this is the specialty of something like Xing Yi, right? Where you don't do a fancy movement. You just 
do the movement at the exact right time so that your force is applied exactly where it needs to be to overcome the other person's force. And your stability is such that when they impact that, it, it hits them, not you. Yeah, and it's it. I think at that level, it it's so precise. The timing is so precise, and the the awareness of the other person's mind is so precise that like a spinning ball, and that something hits it, and it just bounces off. Right? That there's a no force is going to land on him. Right? That somehow this this internal connection takes all the force away from his body, his physical body, and so right. that. The, this dispersal of of force is really what's happening. So it's you can talk about energy, but it really has to do with uh, incredible control of the internal world. You know, the internal yeah. body and the ability to transform that in, in very subtle ways that cause force to move through the body uh, without. Uh, restriction without contraction and that speaks to that sort of aspect of unification because he says here that a lot of people who move very fast do so by disconnecting and creating large gaps in other words you close your eyes and swing as hard as you can to create speed whereas here he's saying this unification this uh, this connected force is like finding the holy grail where you don't have to your speed isn't created by swinging as hard as you can your speed is almost like your mind and your consciousness is faster and so you end up in the right place before they're able to get there what the stuff lee was talking about in the patreon interview about the mind and how the mind creates movement and the awareness mm. is the, sort of the root of all of the technique i think leo had that down to a t so you know mm. that that uh the term bruce uses is heart mind where that the physical body and the chi and the intent all kind of fuse into one peace and that you know everything leo did was <clears throat> from what i understand very relaxed very smooth and very uh subtle right like it wasn't he didn't do very exaggerated uh sharp movements right everything mm. was very very smooth and uh you know it had that kind of easy going kind of feel and i think you know we've talked before about how all these guys that Bruce trained with, I mean, although in their youth, they probably had a lot more uh, fire, if you will. They were very subtle in, you know, when they would do stuff. I mean, you can see video of Wang Xu Jing and Hung Yi Shang. And, you know, when they do movements, it's, it's pretty uh, dialed down compared to what, ha you know, gets trans transferred down the line there's like the way you train it when you're learning it and when you're in your twenties, thirties, forties, and then mm -hmm. there's what happens when you're, you've done it for 70 years and you're in your eighties, you know, totally. it's obviously, obviously going to look different, but the whole thing with the internal martial arts is you're developing this other, you know, you're developing the inside, not just the outside. And so this is why internal martial artists, do internal martial arts is it, it keeps you, you can keep doing it as you get older because it's, the, it's not just about physical strength and, and speed. Yeah. So just to finish the article here in esoteric warriors, it is a strange world you inhabit when dealing with the power and strength that comes from such a high level of consciousness above and beyond power. Leo had a degree of smoothness that I had never seen in anybody else. He taught me about the nature of mind, and his own martial arts were motivated by intelligent compassion. Being his student was a very rare and valuable experience. And I think there's that that consciousness being the driver at a certain point. Um, that's how you get that smoothness, you know? Right. I was going to say in the smoothness, right? So he uses the term consciousness. I say awareness, but I think it's, you know, it's just that same thing. It's, it's that, you know, mindfulness is another term that gets thrown around there. Intent. Right, all of these things, but you know, again, that I think is, is is it's what happens when you practice for decades and decades. Right, I think that naturally comes to life the longer you practice, and I'm sure every martial art has this consciousness develop. It's just that internal martial arts do it on purpose. It doesn't just happen sort of on its own. You're seeking it. You're trying to do it. 
I think, you know, and I, that makes it a little bit different. I, I think, Leo, that a good parallel is if you've ever seen video of, uh, I think his name's Mafune. He was Kano's student, a judo guy, little dude. Mm -hmm. And Bruce uh, mentioned that he trained with them a little bit. You know, and he's the same sort of thing. He said, you know, the guy was, you know, 5'1", you know, 100 pounds soaking wet and never touched you lighter than a feather. But Bruce, a young guy would pick up dudes twice his size and toss him across the room and you can see video of this guy and he's just, it's amazing i mean he's right you know, just, i mean he doesn't look impressive physically but what happens he's not doing I mean, he, his the partners biggest, are flying the point is more that yeah like he's not really do quote unquote doing that much it's just his timing and his flow is so good that you, they can't get anything on him yeah. and i think uh again that that's part of uh when you develop internal power in any art, it, it starts to develop that those certain characteristics of smoothness and uh, being relaxed. And so, you know, again, I think what Bruce was saying is that the, that Leo's control of his mind was really the thing that gave him that incredible, you know, jump or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So looking at another article that we dug up, Fighting Arts International, we've quoted from this one in the past about some of Bruce's other teachers. Here he's discussing Leo Hung Jae's use of martial arts, and I think this illustrates a lot about what makes his skill special. When Liu came at me using Xin Yi, despite the fact that he was in his 80s, I just could not stop his hands. And the movement was so clean. It was literally like a bullet being fired from a gun. His Bagua was just incredibly smooth and unavoidable. And his Wu style Tai Chi could be so soft that no matter how much force you used, it seemed to disappear. So he's describing the three different martial arts there. And he begins by describing his use of Xing Yi, like being like a, a bullet being fired from a gun. So that, that emphasizes that sharp multiple attack sort of punching through it approach that Xing Yi has, even in a guy, an older guy in his eighties is able to, uh, <laughs> You could not stop his hands. I mean, again, I, I think he doesn't, you don't lose it entire. I mean, it doesn't matter how old you get. If you trained it for that many right. years. It's, uh, and, and that was one of the things Bruce said that, you know, about, you know, all these older guys that he found in China, that most of them uh, that kept their, their power up into their later years did either Santi or, Bagua circle walking as a daily or almost daily practice because that type of training just keeps the body, you know, stronger in a strong in a way that uh, I think just doing the forms in a you know sort of right move, moving fashion doesn't quite do right. It adds a little something. And his bagua was incredibly smooth and unavoidable. That uh, that rings a bell in the sense of. Once you get close to Kumar, it's sort of unavoidable. Like you can either run away or if you get too close, then his Bagua's arms are just snakes that somehow envelop you. And that that's different from that gun firing a round of Xing Yi. There's that uh, unescapable aspect of Bagua, the twisting and turning. Right. There's, there's the, uh, you know, Xing Yi is the yang, Tai Chi is the yin, right? So the thing about the Tai Chi just being super duper soft and no matter right. how much. You know, again, it's a, it it's a disappear completely as if he's not even there at all. Right. It's about uh, the phrase Bruce likes to use is uh, force has no meaning if there's no resistance. Right. So mm. if whether whether that force is being over. So Shingy, right. Force overcomes force. It just does. You, you overcome the other person's force by taking more a, force <laughs> well, or an angle. Yeah. An angle by taking an angle by by applying your force to an angle where their force has no meaning, right? Mm. So uh, the, it generally a 45 degree angle, right? You step to a 45 degree angle, boom. So the other person's force doesn't directly hit you. It it hits you know yours, but yours directly hits them. Right. Uh, Bagua is their force comes at you and you move around you know you take it away from them and you move around them or you can also use it to cut through them so it kind of does both tai chi is their force comes at you and you 
take it away from you and then again apply force where they don't have it but the difference is you know you're not uh meeting their force right at that point of you know, mm -hmm. drawing them in right so this the is way the way he does yeah right so the the rollback technique is is the classic tai chi technique right where absorbing yeah for example, Xing Yi's classic technique is Bung Chen, right? It's it's just which is like a bullet coming out, you know. It's just oh. that just that single point that just crushes anything that it hits. Um, and from the right angle, that can overcome no matter you know no matter how much you put out. Like you said, if it doesn't land, um, Xing exactly. Yi just cut right across. And and I think you know at a very high level, you can get to the point where uh, forced doesn't land on you even when you're basically standing still right that that you're able to manipulate the subtle you know internal pressures inside your body and the force you know this is like when you see guys do like like Wang Shi Jing do the iron shirt stuff where they just take a blow and you know it doesn't seem to do anything a lot of that is that the force is being dissipated through the body before it actually gets to anything important right um, doesn't hurt to be larger, but you know, I've seen the small guys do it too. Um, that's why it's called iron shirt. It's like a, you know, it's a cover, right? It blocks things from getting in. Um, so I wanted to look a little further in the article here. Um, Bruce is describing his experience in 1981 when he's in Beijing. Uh, he says he did the 24 move simplified Tai Chi government form in the, you know, in the morning um, I had to do this study to get my visa. But in the afternoons, I was studying with the top man in my Xing Yi and Bagua lineage. The whole experience was quite an eye-opener. He isn't a huge fan of the Wushu Todd at the time, although his teacher, Meng Hui Feng, was excellent. Um, but then, he, you know, just to finish this, this whole article and this whole issue of the book, he says, uh, what Liu was doing was of such quality and of a higher level than anyone I had ever encountered before. By this time, I had been studying the martial arts more than 20 years full time. The simplicity, the sheer competence and precision of what this man was doing was exactly what the way the masters I had met in Taiwan and elsewhere had said the old grandmasters used to be like. Talking with Leo and working with him, it was clear to see that these arts were in their original form as passed on directly by their founders. Uh, so, you know, once again, just really high praise that this older guy is this link to the, the greatest masters of the past. And, uh, we don't have too many other people who speak about Master Leo, but every you know every piece we've heard is that he was working at a very high level. Especially that uh, again, he mentions simplicity, competence, precision. Um, those are the things you use when you don't have overwhelming physical strength. Yeah, and even when you do have overwhelming physical strength, it's it's never uh, you know if you can save it and not have to use it that's the best right so to have the big bomb and never use it is is better than having to use it right so <laughs> moving on to the next chapter in the book chapter nine we'll look at the third swing of opening the energy gates he begins by saying the third swing has a number of functions most importantly it works with the upper internal organs the heart and the lungs and it energizes the brain um, so the other swings, the first swing is down lower in your body, lower down hand. The second swing, the hand starts striking midway up the body. So that starts affecting this middle dantian. And then the, uh, third, the third swing here is working with the heart, the lungs, and the brain. So this whole upper section of your body. And I'm assuming that the whipping of the hands up in the air is, is your cue to let your energy rise up to those areas and affect them in some way. Well, it's actually the opposite. That how much you can internally bounce your energy is as high up as you lift your arms. So one of the uh, common mistakes in this is people reach that point and rather than just let their arms relax and drop again, they kind of throw their shoulders and their head back a little bit to get their arms to go higher or just use their shoulder muscles. So the whole thing of this is to get the sense of like a bounce inside of your body that goes down and up and down and up. And that starts to generate a spring in your qua. So you get a physical bounce. Oh, shit. Bam, bam. You get a physical bounce. And then that 
physical bounce eventually gets your arms to swing up in the air. So you can think of it a bit like a pendulum, right? That um, they can only swing up as high as it starts. So usually when you do the third swing, you pick your arms up to a certain height, you drop them, mm. and that's kind of your impetus to go uh, in, into the movement, right? So if you start with your arms up higher than you can actually bring that thing up inside of you, uh, it generally causes, like I said, the sort of a le- like a leaning forward and a throwing your head, head back. With, yeah. yeah. Instead of keeping the spine straight and just using the legs and the quad. I mean, obviously, this is hard to describe it, but, you know. You, right. Yeah, if you've done it, you know what I'm talking about. Right. Those are good tips. And he talks a little bit more about other stuff. It uh, it it helps the uh, vertebrae get more spring, opens up the uh, shoulder joint to move around. It opens the hips and the quad area. And then finally, he says, it teaches the body to instantaneously relax and let go on command. That's that feeling of when your arm's up in the air and you can completely let it go and just drop completely that you're talking about to create that upward spring. And that's easier said than done, you know, the relaxing to that level without some clenching in your arm or some, uh, you know, your mind forcing your arm to do something. It's really hard to let that thing just flop and fall down to your side. And then as you try to get it to move, avoid the frustration of like just making it go, you know? Yeah. The, the third swing, I mean, it, it's, um, it's the ultimate as far as qua exercises, right? It, it has all the elements of all the things the quad can do. Right? So you got up and down vertical folding and side to side folding. So it, it does all these movements and to, to get the coordination in your, in your legs of just, how to shift, turn, go up, go down, shift, turn, go up, go down, shift, turn, go because it's a it's a four part. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into this, but the, but mm-hmm. the rhythm of, the rhythm of it is different from the, the the first two swings, and so just getting that ability to do those four part things with your hips is really a challenge. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the hips, the next thing is he talks about how this one uses more pumping motion in the hip fold joint. This pumps the synovial fluid in the hip joint and releases a very powerful current of chi from the earth, feet, and legs that is pumped into the upper body organs, joint, spine, and brain. Yeah. So there's a very liquid surge going up and down with each one of these swings. It's a fairly rare exercise uh to actually see it done properly. Um, the closest thing most people do is they do it without the turning. So the arms just swing up, swing down, swing up, swing down <clears throat> because of that, you know, the, the, the difficulty in making that change. So we start by looking at uh, the instructions for the third swing here. So there's a few different steps to it. Um, but he says, you know, first thing, learn to shift your weight to left, center, and right. So again, really emphasizing the ability to cleanly shift all the way to the left, uh, balance yourself at 50-50, and then shift all the way to the right without, uh, you know, without, mm, but keep staying aware of that without without cheating kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you squeeze the quad, open and close the joints there. Um, and then he gets into sort of the details of the four parts. You know, your weight's 50-50, then it's 100% on the right. Um you use the pretty much same skills that you used in the second swing of, of opening up your quad and turning to one side or the other. Um, you know, he suggests that it will take time for this movement to become fluid as most people have let their pelvis rust and stiffen. And I think that's a good advice to take like this, this one, you just got to kind of get into it and just keep working on it. Cause this one definitely feels funky at first. You know, once you get the hang of it, it actually feels amazing. Well, it's really important to do it in stages so that you don't hurt your knee. Okay, so in the second swing, you shift over to one side and you turn and your body stays on the same plane, right? So if you had a, you know, a, a grid, your, your horizontal grid doesn't change much. Might go up or down a little bit, but not, you know, you're, you're basically staying on one plane. The third swing, <clears throat> it uses a, a vertical plane and a horizontal plane. So it's the second, it's everything you're doing in the second swing plus 
adding a vertical up and down. So the first part of it, when you're in the middle and you drop your arms, that's a vertical, right? And then when you turn, that's obviously horizontal. And then there's a vertical to bring your arms back up. Then you drop your arms, you kind of catch that with the turning, and then you bring it back up again. So that's the that's the four, four part. And, then, and that's only gotten you from going from the center to the left and back to the center. So then you do the exact same thing. You drop your arms. As your arms reach the bottom, you turn to the side, you open, that brings your arms back up. You drop them again, you close, you turn to the middle, you bring them, you open again and you bring them up. So there's, you know, it, it's just getting those different pieces to be stable, right? So I think most people, the up and down part is not that difficult if you've been doing quad squats because it's simply, it's just a fast mm -hmm. quad. It's a fast quad fast squat. Fast quad squat, yeah. The, main, the, the big thing to watch out for is that it doesn't, move the tip of your knee forward when you start to drop into it the, the visual is like a ski jumper where you drop and your butt goes back and down but your knees don't go anywhere right so it's your hips your knees bending but but it but your uh shin bone stays basically mm -hmm. straight like vertical it doesn't bend forward when you squat um Everything from the knees down stays exactly where it is. Alignment wise, you might lift up a leg and move it, but it just stays. All the angles stay exactly. But that's the same. at the point when you're dropping, you are not mm. lifting. You're not lifting. Right, your right. Leg up. That, that, that comes when you start to come back up. So you you drop and you kind of fold into it, and that gets your arms to come down. Then, as it's coming up, that's when you open the hip and will turn to the side. So that the timing of sort of catching this bounce right? The, mm -hmm. the, as you drop and swing your arms up, there's a bouncing and you have to um, sort of find the, the, the sweet spot between when you're going down and when you're coming you gotta up. You got to catch that. Yeah. You got to catch right. that momentum and carry it. And it's, it's all about finding this sort of, you know, nice, easy flow to uh, sort of swing him back and forth. Right. And, it's a, if you find yourself clenching and tightening and crunching and over swinging, you got to back off. That's that's been my experience repeatedly where I found myself swinging myself too hard from one side to the other. And I had to just reduce it as as painful as it is to do it poorly. You've got to just reduce the momentum well, again. It has to do with where you start, that if you start by throwing your arms down and kind of giving it this big heavy jerk motion and then swinging it, swinging it back, you'll you'll get a lot of movement in your arms, but you won't probably be moving your claw properly and you're probably going to hurt your knees. So the thing to to get is that what I said earlier about how much can you bounce, right? And and there's a whole thing about this sort of internal springing motion that you develop. And can you get that thing to spring down to your feet and up to your head? And if you can get it to go down to your feet and up to your head, your arms will cleanly get up to the top of your head. But what happens for most people is that thing hits their sternum or their chest or somewhere in their shoulders where they're tight. And that's about as high as their arms can go. So, so my advice to most people is do it where your arms don't go up higher than your chest for a little while and just see if you can get it entirely from your legs without any sort of arm clenching, lifting, stretching, right? That, that your arms are just loose. And as you increase the speed of your waist over time, your arms will swing higher, but you don't swing your arms higher by working harder. You just kind of get into this, like, uh, it's like a pendulum. You know, I said like mm. a pendulum. The pendulum just starts to swing faster. Tick, tick, tick. You know, it's like a clock. You tick, tick. You just speed up the, you wind the coil a little bit tighter and it speeds up, but you're not working any harder to do it because of this the way that it springs and regenerates and springs it recycles itself yeah, yeah. um so just ahead. to finish this section of the uh 
chapter, you know, he talks about what you're talking about of not overdoing it, um, not bending too far, not squatting too far, not hurting your knees, which he's very clear on. But I wanted to look at the part where he says, uh, feel the chi spiral up inside your body. Make sure that the turning in the third swing twists the lower internal organs and that this spiraling energy continues up through the center of the body directly into the brain. Um, so, yeah, so you, you spiral energy through your lower internal organs. So essentially, I think at the beginning, you just try not to freeze your lower internal organs. Well, well each swing brings it up a notch, right? Mm -hmm. So the first swing gets the lower internal organs. So you only have to bring it up to there. And then the second swing, you bring it up to the middle because you're trying to get the spleen and the liver. And then this one, you're bringing that thing up all the way and there's here. a spiraling aspect to it there's a as you twist the body it, it kicks off a spinning kind of upward swing a little bit right initially you just let the physical turning twisting of the body create that spiraling and you don't actually have to add much to it but that's what the spiraling energy body is is you start to actually direct those spirals uh, in specific ways for each movement. But he's what he's saying is that that, that is what the spiral is doing. It's just, just not telling you how to do that. Right. So you start with a phys the twisting leads to a re – when you recycle the twisting, it becomes spiraling kind of if, it, if the wave continues to carry. Instead of just twisting left, right, there's an upward as well that keeps it on a there's drilling. Some, there's some intermediate steps, but, yeah, that's essentially it. So finally, the last thing here, make sure the pumping of the qua is clear and deliberate. So just to end, uh, he says, it's easy to forget about the qua. We don't pay much attention to it in the West. That's all he says, but yeah, keep that good. work on the qua is a good way to finish. Yeah, that's a good place to wrap up because that's, uh, like I said, I think the most important skill in all of this. Keep connecting to the qua and you can't go wrong. Hey folks, Isaac here. Uh, just a quick couple things. Next season, we're going to be... Um, answering some questions from listeners we have almost enough to do the whole season but we still need a couple more so if anyone out there wants to ask us a question about what we've been doing or just in general uh it may make the cut um and the other thing is leave us a positive rating review on itunes if you can uh really helps just kind of make us more visible all right uh thanks a lot and take care